The Johnson Municipal Imagination is a very special place. Uh, it is a home above all else for research. But it is a home of research that believes rightly that it is a field of education, unlike perhaps something like field mathematics. Research is only as good as its application. For a research and education to sit in a research journal it is a certain kind of death which we should accept. Uh, this research has to matter for children in schools. And that's the mission of this institute. It is to break down the silos that have too often separated excellent research from policy makers to practitioners, teachers, superintendents, directors of schools, principals, and above all else, children and families. That's why we we, as a school, do this, we walk the walk. We have opened, as many of you know, in the small kids, the first new public school in Baltimore in a couple of decades. Uh, our faculty are well known for being involved in the schools, whether to Paul Roberts, Ralph Hans, Ralph Slavin, and so many others, whose work is in the we have with us Eric and others who are almost every week involved directly in schools as well as in front of their own writing and research. I think above all else, what we've come to believe is that in this huge country, what happens in place A so often exists only in that place. I remember in New York when I had the privilege of being commissioner traveling from Albany to Syracuse, to Rochester, to Buffalo, to Yonkers, and it was in each case I entered a new country. The practice 20 miles down the road, I might as well have been in the mud I'm not exaggerating. So part of our mission and why we're here tonight is to open the windows to say we are one country in which many, many things are going on in education that nobody else seems to know. And the things work as well as don't work. That extraordinary people are making a difference for children everywhere, and in particular underprivileged children. So that's why we're here. We're here because we want to learn from what our colleagues are doing across the country, from what the research is saying, and what the practitioners are doing to move the dial of underprivileged children. And that matters. Tomorrow I'll have the privilege of addressing the Ways and Means Committee uh, in Annapolis, and it will be the same message. Let's break down these walls. Let's bring to you the information you need to make a difference in children. To introduce our special guests and to moderate this evening, I'm delighted to turn the podium over to the Institute's Deputy Director, Dr. Ashley Berner, whose scholarly focus is on exploring the outcomes of different school sectors both in this country and internationally. Uh, her book on this subject is almost done. Um, I'm encouraging her to finish it rapidly. Uh, in the meantime,
So tonight, we want to look at three different approaches to education and to ask if they improve educational excellence and if they do so equitably. The first that we'll look at is a curricular intervention that actually brings high-end academic rigor to students and the International Baccalaureate Program used to be considered a largely suburban phenomenon in this country. And in 1997, Chicago Public Schools had the audacity to bring it to struggling neighborhood high schools. And the results were so stunning in terms of college attainment and perseverance that it became a big focus of the Chicago Public Schools to scale this up, both in whole school models and programs. And I'm delighted that Sarah Levin is here from Chicago to speak about that with us. The second intervention is really about access. It used to be that only well-off families could elect to send their children to private school or to move to a so-called better school district. And now it is becoming possible, thanks to public charter schools, tax credits, and vouchers, for students who are from low-income families or even African-American families to, to have those options. So those, those uh, interventions are not without controversy, as we know, but we're not an institute that wants to avoid controversy. So we invited Patrick Wolf, who's one of the nation's experts in researching the outcomes of different choice models. <coughs> Finally, we have a Baltimore um, native, uh, Frank Hammer, who runs the Bar Early College High School model. Bar Early College High School here, and the, the Early College High School model allows students to graduate from high school with an AA degree. And it's become a priority for legislatures around the country. There are some <coughs> several hundred early college high schools, and we're we're happy that the representative of BAR, which is one of the most successful of the early college high school models, is here with us. So, again, thank you to our speakers for being flexible enough to change your schedules, playing schedules, and all of this. And we're delighted to have you here as we ask the question under which conditions is any of these interventions helpful to children? So, thank you very much. Hello, good evening. Hi. Uh, my name is Sarah Levin. I've been with the Chicago Public Schools for 19 years now. And in the last eight years, I've been serving as the IB district coordinator for the diploma program. And um, I basically spend my days um, advocating for and supporting our 22 high schools in Chicago that, that have IB. I'm going to um, try to do this in 15 minutes. That's all the time I have. And I, I'm, if I rush, I'm sorry, but there's a lot I want to get through. I'm going to give you a very brief overview of IB. Um, I'm going to talk about um, some of the student outcomes that we've seen in Chicago and some of the research that's come out of Chicago on IB. And I'm going to, I'm going to touch a little bit on the cost effectiveness of the program. And I think we're going to get to challenges a little bit later. But to start, um, I want to explain that the IB is actually a continuum of education. It starts in pre-K, and it goes all the way up to, to 12th grade. Um, in Chicago, we have all these programs. So we have the primary years program, that is for pre-K through fifth grade, the middle years program, which is sixth grade through 10th grade. And then we have the diploma program and the career-related program, which is for students in the 11th and 12th grade. But for the purpose of this presentation, and in the interest of time, I'm only really going to focus on the diploma program, which is the program that I oversee in Chicago. So here it is, the diploma program. So in a nutshell, this is really hard to do. <laughs> IB is a very complex educational program. But imagine yourself as a diploma program student. You're taking pretty much college level courses in the 11th grade and the 12th grade in English, world language, science, social science, math, and the arts. You're also taking a course called the theory of knowledge, which is considered at the core of the program for a reason, because it teaches students how to think. It encourages them to come to know things and learn how they know things. 
It's probably the one course that you'll hear um, graduates of IB say really prepared them for college. It just teaches them how to think. And then that's not it. <laughs> Students in the diploma program also have to do what's called creativity, activity, and service. That is a requirement that is beyond the school day. Um, so it's not all about academics in IB. They have to engage in activities that are creative, that are service to the community, and that are physically active. So it encourages a well-rounded student. And then they have to do an extended essay, which is an extensive 4,000-word independent research paper, not connected to any one particular course, per se, but they have to do it on their own with a little bit of advising along the way. So in a nutshell, it's a very, very rigorous program. Now I'm gonna go into um, Chicago Public Schools, just give you a basic picture. For those of you who don't know, we're the third largest district in the US. We have close to 400,000 students in our system. We have pre-K through 12 in 660 schools. When I started in Chicago Public Schools 19 years ago, there was one IB program I didn't even know. I hadn't even heard of IB. But the school that I was at was one of those schools that decided that we wanted IB. This sounds like something that would be good for our students. Um, it was good for that one school back in 1980 um, that had 31 students. Now, fast forward about 40 years, right, 40 plus years, we now have 75 programs, authorized programs, in Chicago public schools. That's across 22 high schools and 31 elementary schools. So why? <laughs> why did we grow like this? Why are there so many programs? Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward because there was research that came out that showed the value added with IB, and there were people in the positions of power to say, we should be doing this more. This is good for students. This is good for children. So we have expanded to the point where we're kind of busting at the seams. Um, we, we have a lot of programs in Chicago, but it's, it's serving 21,000 students now. We went from 31 students to 21,000 students. And we're still growing, by the way. We have 10 schools that are actually in the authorization process right now. So now you might be thinking, well, IB is really, you know, it's not for, it's not for all students. It's, for, it's an elite program just for the, you know, the wealthy. Like Ashley was saying, it's a suburban um, program. Not in Chicago. So we have, um, if you look at, this is just the 11th and 12th grade breakdown of students that qualify for free and reduced lunch in CPS. About 84% of our students in the, in the district qualify for free and reduced lunch. But in IB, oh, I don't know why that number's not there. <laughs> that should say 76%. There are 76% of uh, the students in IB qualify for free and reduced lunch. So the picture I'm trying to show is we're not, they're not different. They're the same as the student, as the regular student in the system. Same, basically, with the racial breakdown, it's, it's about the same. 86% of our students in IB are not white in CPS. They're, in, they're all in neighborhood high schools. These are not selective enrollment or magnet schools. These are neighborhood high schools. So the IB student reflects the student in that neighborhood high school. Now I want to tell you a little bit about the outcomes that we've seen. So a lot of times you'll hear what, what is, why is IB good? What, what does it do for you? Um, one of the things you'll hear the most is that it's a very good preparation for college. So how do we measure that? We look at college enrollment. Are, are IB students enrolling in college at a higher rate as our non-IB students? And yes, they are. Um, as you can see, um, last 2014, in 2014, 82% of our IB students were enrolled in college as compared to 57% of of the general population in Chicago public schools. But once they're in, are they staying in? Are they persisting in college? So we've looked at that. We just started looking at that, actually. And what we found is, yeah, they're persisting at a really high rate. We have 90% of our IB students who start freshman year of college 
are actually going on into the sophomore year of college as compared to 69% of their peers. So these are pretty good statistics, right? I'm actually going to skip this just for the interest of time. So these, the, the data I just showed you is, is internal. It comes from our, our data department. So I wanted to also show you that the re research is, has been done as well. We're fortunate to have the University of Chicago Consortium on S Chicago School Research in Chicago that has done some extensive research on students in CPS and in particular in IB. And this, this study came out a few years ago but it was based on students that were in the program in between 2003 and 2007, so it's a little bit older, but again, they're showing the same things that we're seeing in that students are um, attending four-year colleges at a higher rate than their peers. They are um, going to more selective colleges at a higher rate than their peers, and they are persisting at four-year colleges at a higher rate than their peers. And, um, this, this is actually, their peers are considered their students that are in selective enrollment schools in advanced placement classes. So what I was showing you before for our district level is just all students. But this is actually students that are, that are really at the same sort of comparison to them. You know, they're, they're advanced level, you know, students. Okay, I'm gonna say a little bit about cost effectiveness. Um, I've been asked to talk about this. This was a really challenging question for me because there hasn't really been a lot of research on this, on cost effectiveness. There was one study done um, by a, a woman named Anna Saavedra and she found that there, there was a cost benefit um, of, I, of being an IB because students um, are more likely to graduate from high school that are in IB. They're more likely to earn more money, basically. But then I, f I figured out another example I could tell, because I was speaking with um, a gentleman who's been a partner for many years um, with Chicago Public Schools at DePaul University. His name is Brian Spittle, and he's done a lot of research on IB students in, at the university. And what he told me the other day was pretty astounding. He said that of the freshman students at DePaul that graduated from IB in Chicago Public Schools, 85% had earned some form of credit at the, at the university. Whoa, 85%, really? <laughs> That's a lot, because if, that just, if they just earned one you know, court, if they just got credit for one course, that's a lot of money right there. That's more money than we spend on their exams in the, in the district, which is the major cost of IB to the district. So right there, you're, you're you're, you're doing pretty well. But he told me there's students that have earned a whole year of college credit. So add up those <laughs> dollar signs, and that, that's, that's really a, about cost effectiveness. I'm not gonna talk about that right now. Um, I actually, when I, when I speak about IB, I feel bad that I can't bring students with me because they're the best voice. They, they'll, they're the, they will really convince you why IB is such an amazing program to experience. So I brought a, a video. I actually have a little clip of the video if I have time to show it. I'm going to show it. Um, and it's in the student voice. So you're going to hear a student. This is um, from several years ago. We made this video to sort of promote, it was to promote the program in our district. So we're going to show you a little clip do well in college because they just don't know how to cope and you are getting coping skills that are really more important than how smart you are. When I started work for the International Baccalaureate Organization 21 years ago there was one school, Lincoln Park High School on the north side and now there's over 40 programs. And that's largely because of what is happening in the Chicago public schools. Your skills, experiences and exposure make you the best in the world and all the self-sacrifice and the studying does pay off. The transition from high school to college was surprisingly easy. And I tell everyone that I meet that IB, its greatest skill is that it teaches you how to be a student. It teaches you the skills that you need. And it made the transition a lot easier. I really did know what I was getting into. I was accepted into the University of Chicago at the beginning of 2007. I also earned the Chicago Public Schools scholarship that covers full tuition. 
here at the university, which is a huge help. I've had the fortune of doing internships and working on the uh, Obama campaign uh, last year, going to different cities and states. Regarding community service, I am the director of a group called uh, Magic Teen Talk Chicago. It's a group based out of Woodlawn and the Inglewood communities, and they target high-risk youth, African-American, in high school right now, and really cultivate and capture skills that they have and allow them to do something productive with them. I just accepted into the uh, study abroad program to South Africa. Certainly, the wealth of information and experience is something that I think IB in particular is something that, that helped me out a great deal, where I'm actually applying this global perspective, this global learning and understanding. When I first began at Morgan Park High School, my counselor and my mom actually talked about the IB program and what it meant, the critical thinking, the global perspective, things of that nature. Indians in South Africa at that time couldn't vote they had to carry passes with them at all times or they would be randomly thrown in jail. Uh, I think I had the real fortune of really being able to experience great teaching. It was a dialogue. It was, here's an idea, here's some of the facts. What do you think about this? Uh, why do you think this happened? And what are the ramifications of that now? But I think they'll find that it's easier to challenge one group versus another because one's going to lead to more like bad things So the happen. person who has a choice is the oppressor then? I think the program is excellent in creating and fostering this environment where you have to be well-rounded and encouraging not only the academics but through the CAST project, the element of service, the element of creativity and action. I think those build the best type of student and I think that, you know, if anything, I think I'm a well-rounded, diverse student in my ideas, my thinking and what I actually do. The biggest advice I would have to future IB students is that it's something that you have to want. You have to want this rich academic growth, personal growth. You have to want the challenge, but it all starts with the work you're doing now and that the hard work and the perseverance and the effort is something that you cannot stop because it ultimately will pay off. College truly is, in one way or another, easier. You work the hardest that you worked up until now in high school. There's skills that they're learning. Those are all skills that IB does in the classroom that you take out with you wherever you go. And I think that's the key to the IB education. I think IB has changed me because before um, I was more of a timid person. People told me that oh, it was going to be so hard to get the IB diploma. I mean, IB is probably the most misunderstood best experience of your life. You learn how to be well-rounded, you learn how to be a hard worker and stay a hard worker. And while you're at it, you're like, oh, this is going to be tough. But by the end of it, you're like, this has made me a much better person. It's a great challenge for you, and it's going to prepare you, and you're going to learn so much from it. You're in a classroom with a teacher, and the teacher's not lecturing, but it's more of a dynamic environment. You're all engaged in conversation. So already you're exposed to different ways of thinking. You have meaningful work. And because it's such a well-rounded program, and it makes you kind of dabble in, you know, sciences and arts and community service. Also being an IB, since we all had the same classes together with um, a certain group of people, I felt like we were a family. You connect with the, all these people that are like from different cultures and it's you become more sensitive to their to their way of life and it makes learning a, a great experience for you yeah mm -hmm. okay that's a tough act to follow uh, i'm delighted to be back in maryland uh, i lived here for nine years in rockville when i was a professor at georgetown university and when i look outside it reminds me why i live in arkansas <laughs> So, um, because I teach at the University of Arkansas, I'm required by our university, as all the professors are, to issue this disclaimer. I am not, in fact, a spokesmodel for the University of Arkansas. You could have figured that out, but um, I have to do this, so I do. I want to talk about school choice. What is school choice? Uh, why might it improve urban education? What does the research show about its impacts on participant attainment, participant achievement, uh, the competitive effects on non-participants, and cost effectiveness? And then I'm going to talk very briefly about parental involvement, or parental empowerment research, and issues and takeaways. So, um, school choice is any government initiative that provides a substantial amount of financial assistance for parents to enroll a child in a preferred school. That's the definition. It takes a number of different forms. Uh, the forms that I'm going to talk about today are public charter schools and three forms of private school choice, school vouchers, tax credit scholarships, and education savings accounts, or ESAs. 
There are 43 states that have public charter school laws, and they serve two and a half million students. Uh, Maryland, of course, uh, is one of those states with, with uh, public charter schools. There are 27 states that host 54 different private school choice programs that enroll over 400,000 students. So here's a map of the private school choice programs across the United States. And you see that, that programs are available in every region of the country except for the Pacific Coast. Uh, and when we look here at Maryland, Maryland has three uh, jurisdictions that border it that offer private school choice programs. To the north, Pennsylvania has two large tax credit scholarship programs. Uh, Washington, D.C. has the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Voucher Program. And Virginia, to the south, has a very small-scale tax credit scholarship program. <coughs> So these programs are different in some important respects. When you think about uh, which ones are they, are they a direct government program? Uh, public charter schools are not a direct government program. They're, they're an education policy that allows independent public entities to spring up to provide education to students. And they're financed through per pupil formulas and uh, direct grants. States. School vouchers are a direct government program. They're administered by government entities uh, and they're based on annual appropriations, so they're funded through the appropriation process. Tax credit scholarships are not direct government programs. They're funded by tax credits given to corporations or individuals who donate to a nonprofit scholarship granting organization. So they're really arm's length from the from government involvement, the government never handles the funds, they just issue the tax credits that, that induce people to make these contributions. And ESAs are kind of mixed. Uh, they are established and overseen by government entities, and they are funded by appropriations, but they, they don't really have as much direct involvement and in implementation as direct as the vouchers do. Are our parents required to supplement, that is pay more, for their child's education in these various alternatives to traditional public schooling. Well, that depends, that varies. For charters, no, they do not. Basically, charters are free public schools. For vouchers, also, they do not. Parents do not have to uh, add to the value of the voucher in almost every case. For tax credit scholarships, they do. Uh, basically, the scholarships are pretty modest in the amount of money provided, and families have to have to provide uh, some of the funds. And with ESAs, it, it depends. It really varies by, by program. Uh, are there substantial regulations of these school choice uh, programs and policies? For charter schools, it varies across the different states. The states set their policies for regulating charter schools. Maryland has one of the most heavily regulated charter school um, policies. It's rated by two different charter school advocacy groups as, as an F in terms of policy because it's, the policies are very restrictive and, and do not pr promote sort of the vibrant growth and development of the public uh, charter school uh, market. Uh, vouchers also uh, have substantial government regulations on them in terms of who's eligible and, uh, and the participating private schools. Tax credit scholarships do not have those substantial regulations. And ESAs also uh, are not that heavily regulated. And in terms of the number of programs, again, 43 states, uh, hosting a total of 6,500 public charter schools nationwide. In terms of vouchers, there are 24 voucher programs, there are 26 tax credit scholarship programs, just four ESAs, but they are sort of the fastest growing, they're kind of like the iPhone of private school choice. Uh, there's a lot of buzz about ESAs because of their flexibility. So why might school choice help? Uh, this basically is based on, on economic market theory, uh, the theory behind school choice. And one way that choice might help is if it provides increased access to quality schools. And the, the thought process here is that greater organizational autonomy is going to lead to greater innovation, 
and greater innovation is going to lead to greater quality. That's sort of the logic model of uh, school choice, increasing access to quality schools. There's also sort of a competing argument, or a complementary argument, that school choice might help if it provides a better match of students to schools. That is, parents, the assumption is parents know their children well, if they have choices of a variety of different type, types of schools, then they will place their child in a school that's a better match for their educational needs. There's also the theory of the advantages of competition of competitive markets over institutional monopolies, that competition instigates a motivation to improve, and that also brings about greater efficiency. And then finally, uh, school choice might help because it provides an educational and political empowerment of parents. Now, these are all theories behind school choice. I'm a data guy. I'm an, I'm an evidence guy. I'm an empirical social scientist. So I'm mainly interested in testing these theories with strong research design and lots of rich evidence. And so when we look at the research background on school choice alternatives, we can cut it in four different ways. Attainment effects, achievement effects, competitive effects, and cost effects. So educational attainment uh, is a measure of the, um, the degree of exposure a person has had to the educational system. The number of years of education is generally demarcated, though, by benchmarks such as high school graduation and college enrollment. And as I like to say, how far you go matters more than how much you know. Basically, um, research has established that there is a stronger connection between positive, with, with positive life outcomes for educational attainment than there is for test scores. And another way to put it is, there's a reason why we throw parties for people who graduate from high school and college. Uh, there is some research on the effect of school choice on educational attainment. Basically, there are, are six studies. Uh, these cover hip charter schools, charter schools in Florida and Chicago, uh, two studies of the Milwaukee School Voucher Program, one of the DC Voucher Program, and one of the New York City Scholarship Program. Five of these studies find positive effects of choice on the likelihood of high school graduation and or college enrollment, and these positive effects are large in magnitude, 20 to 30%. An increase in the likelihood of achieving those benchmarks. There's one study that finds that these gains are only limited to African American students and students of immigrants. These are disadvantaged subgroups that are at least helped by access to choice. So let's take a quick look at the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program's effects on attainment. This was a study that I led for the US uh, Institute for Education Sciences. It was a random assignment study. And the control group of students who did not get a voucher graduated from high school at a rate of 70%. The effect of using an opportunity scholarship uh, to attend a private school instead was to increase the graduation rate to 91 percentage points. Uh, if, you, if you divide that 21 percentage point gain by the base of 70%, you see that's a 30% increase in the likelihood of graduation for the voucher students. Now let's look at achievement effects. Um, I like to say attainment's more important, but boy, we study achievement like crazy. Uh, we, we are really fascinated with test scores. It is the most common metric of educational impact. And so there's a, a lot more research on the effects of school choice on test scores. First, in the charter school area, Three major national studies, uh, two by Credo and one a meta-analysis by Julian Betts and Emily Tang. The most recent Credo study was focused on urban environments, the National Urban Study. It found that on average, attending a public charter school added 40 days of learning a year in math and 28 days of learning a year in reading. And these gains were larger for this their national state study from 2013, which includes rural areas, found smaller impacts, uh, eight gains of learning a year in reading and basic quality in math. But again, the gains were larger for disadvantaged students. And the Benson Tang of analysis of the individual studies, the summation of the individual uh, results of the studies, 
concluded that charter schools deliver gains in math, but similar results in reading. Uh, the gains appear to be growing over time, uh, are strongest in middle school, and are more common in the more rigorous studies. So that's about the charter schools. When we look at high school choice programs, there are 14 gold standard random science studies, so we can just limit our review to those highly rigorous evaluations. Six of them report positive impacts for all students. Four find positive effects just for African American students. <coughs> two identify no impacts, and two report negative effects. Both, yeah, both of those studies are of a new program in Louisiana. So when, when people say that the uh, research on private school choice is mixed, this is what they're talking about. They're, really, they're talking about the achievement effects of private school choice programs, and they're talking about this sort of display of results, which is a bit of a mixed bag with somewhat of a tilt in a positive direction. Now let's look at the competitive effects on students left behind. These are students who have choice programs in their community but do not avail themselves of those choice programs. Uh, there is a lot of research on the competitive effects of school choice, but mainly it's on voucher programs. There's some on public charter schools. They vary greatly in their methodological rigor. Most report positive effects. Some claim no effect, and then one by Scott Yemberman uh, finds a negative effect. But the most rigorous study was recently published by Jani, and basically uh, she found that there are clear competitive effects of North Carolina charter schools that are positive. And comments that all previous studies of the competitive effects of charter schools are underestimating those effects because they include grade levels that aren't served by the charter schools in the study. And so basically they're throwing in a whole bunch of grades that aren't affected by competition and getting an average effect that's probably biased uh, towards zero. In terms of the research on the competitive effects of private school choice, there are 25 rigorous statistical studies. They're not a random assignment, because you can't randomly assign communities to exposure to choice or not, but they're rigorous quasi-experimental studies. They cover Florida, Milwaukee, Ohio, San Antonio, D.C., Indiana, Louisiana, Maine, and Vermont. And 23 of them conclude that choice-based competition has positive effects on the achievement of the uh, public school students in schools that are affected by choice to find no significant effects. And then there's cost effectiveness. Now, we, we like to think that education is not primarily about money, but uh, as my friend in Chicago is experiencing uh, this fall and in that public school system, a lot of times uh, money has a big effect on education and on what's possible. And so the cost effectiveness of education is an important consideration. <clears throat> when it comes to public charter schools, uh, I led a national study of 31 states that included 95% of all charter enrollees. Uh, basically, we found that charter revenue per pupil averaged $3,800 less than in nearby traditional public schools, and the charter achievement nationally was slightly higher. So, basic cost effectiveness standpoint, you know that if you're getting results that are as good or slightly better with less of an investment of resources, then your program is more cost effective. Or cost effective. So we estimated the cost effectiveness benefit of charter schooling at 39 to 41%. In terms of private school voucher programs, these are more commonly studied in terms of the fiscal effects that they have on uh, the governments that, that pay for education, state and local governments. And there are 28 analyses of cost effectiveness or fiscal effects of private school choice programs. They cover most voucher programs and some tax credit scholarship initiatives. 25 report positive effects so that these programs have positive cost effectiveness. For example, the DC program that I evaluated, we determined that it returned $2.62 for each dollar spent on it. And the 10 oldest voucher programs collectively have saved $1.3 million over 10 years. Finally, what effect does choice have on parents themselves? Well, this is a tricky question to answer. You can't really use the tools of empirical social science quite so much 
And, and so a colleague and I decided to do qualitative research on this question. We tracked 100 families participating in the DC voucher program over five years. These were highly disadvantaged uh, parents, economically, educationally, and politically. They generally were not politically active. We saw and documented through, through a series of focus groups and interviews that many of these parents moved from mere passive clients of government programs to inform the consumers of their child's education. They were much more satisfied with their child's school if given choice, even if their initial choice of school didn't work out for them. And when the program was endangered by congressional action uh, that attempted to end the voucher program, parents themselves rose up in a series of protests uh, and actually really became these activated, empowered citizens whose political activity rescued the program. But when we put it all together, there are many high quality studies of school choice. The evidence shows that school choice in general, I mean, particular studies vary, but in general, the evidence base shows that school choice helps students to exercise choice, students are left behind in public schools, and the state's physical health. Positive effects appear to be larger for disadvantaged students and larger and more consistent on educational attainment than on educational achievement. And there is at least some qualitative evidence that school choice empowers parents. So thank you. college. 
Um, and as part of that broad recruitment that we do for admissions, about 13% of our current enrollment are returning to Baltimore City Schools from private parochial or homeschooling. Okay. Um, so we have high school choice here in Baltimore City, which I think is really great and really exciting. Um, so families know, um, kind of in line with that consumer um, mindset that Dr. Wolf was talking about, that they have a lot of options in the city. Um, we, we strive to position ourselves as a very unique choice among high school options in Baltimore. Um, because the students have this opportunity to earn the diploma and the associate's degree um, tuition free. So for our inaugural year, we had about 600 applicants for 165 seats. And I think that's really significant in a place like Baltimore that sees a lot of schools come and go. And we certainly had a lot of family members who had a lot of tough questions for us, as well they should have. Uh, but I think that the, the power of early college is really an idea um, that, that sells itself in a lot of ways. And I think that's reflected in these admission statistics. Um, this year we have 11 full-time faculty members. Uh, I think this is key, and I, I had the privilege of meeting the mayor a few months ago, and I drew out this statistic, that about half of them moved to Baltimore uh, in order to work with us. So this is really a driver of talent into the city, in addition, of course, to all the great talent that we already have with us. Um, and 73% of them have a terminal master's degree or a PhD in their discipline. Um, so, I'm going to zoom a little bit quickly through the BARD, um, the BARD model. Um, so this is a model that works. So BARD itself has been operating early colleges um, since 1979, beginning with the private Simons Rock uh, College uh, in Massachusetts. The first public early college opened in Manhattan in 2001, um, and you can see that we have six other sibling campuses Cleveland opened in 2014, and then of course we joined in 2015. Um, so what's really compelling about the model is its ability to respond to some very significant local as well as national needs around college attainment. Um, so nationally, we know that 31% of students will complete an associate's degree in three years, which is time and a half. And we know that 59% of students will complete a bachelor's degree in six years. So those statistics are much lower when we're looking at students who are coming from um, high poverty urban districts and also students of color. Um, so for instance, the National Center for Education Statistics tells us that a low income high school student is almost four times less likely to complete a bachelor's degree than their more affluent peers. We also know from education statistics that we're still seeing um, a pretty serious underrepresentation of African American and Latino students in the number of associates and bachelor's degrees that were conferred um, in about the last five or six years. And so what does this look like locally, as a local name? Um, I love the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance um, because they tell us not just about our city as a whole, but they allow us to kind of drill down to the neighborhood level. So we know that citywide, about 27% of Baltimore residents have some college education or beyond. But if you look at the neighborhood level, those disparities between more affluent neighborhoods and less affluent neighborhoods are huge, right? So in North Baltimore, Guilford, Homeland, 74% of the residents there have some college education or beyond. If we look at Old Town Middle East, which is where our building is located, we're looking at 12.4% with some college education or beyond. And this last point is the one that really gets to me, which is we're looking at a $60,000 difference in the median household income between residents in these two neighborhoods. And that a child born in North Baltimore can expect to live 11 years longer than a child who was born in East Baltimore. And so that's why I think, and I'm trained as a historian um, in African American history, why for me, public education is the frontier of the civil rights struggle in this country, and why I wanted to get involved um, in this school. Okay, 
So how does BARD make a difference? All right. Um, we have a lot of really excellent results from our sibling campuses because they've been in operation for so long. Um, so in the class of 2015, 89% of the students earned the Associate of Arts degree along with their diploma. 95% of them go on to continue their education at a four-year college or university. And to date, more than 90% of them have completed their bachelor's degrees, which is, of course, much higher than that 59% national average. Um, there are some local studies that also show us some compelling evidence. Um, so there are three BARD campuses in New York City, BARD early colleges in New York City. So by comparison, the BARD graduates are 31% more likely to finish their bachelor's degree than students who went to a traditional school, 13% more likely than students who went to a specialized or selective school. Um, and in Newark, which is a district that's very much like our own, 72% of last year's graduates, that was the first graduating class from BSEC Newark, graduated with the associate's degree. In a city where only about 13% of the population has an associate's degree. Um, so I think that in, in coming to Baltimore, where we know um, that 32% of Baltimore City public school graduates um, will enroll in college, who enroll in college will finish. I think that we're really poised to make a significant contribution um, to closing that college completion gap, um, and particularly to closing that, the gap that we see by, by race and by socioeconomic status. Thank you for those presentations. I know that there are a lot of questions um, on the part of the audience. Can you all hear me? Is this mic like wonderful? Okay, thank you. So first question that I have is for Sarah. Um, I saw the RAND study that talks about the cost effectiveness in terms of getting kids to graduate from high school. But I'm wondering if this program is viable for a smaller district or how the finances of the IB work. Is it mostly the human capital cost of training teachers? I know that Rahm Emanuel, who's been behind a lot of the growth of IB, said that it costs about 280000 to scale up to create a wall-to-wall -wall program. So mm -hmm. talk to us about what it takes from the financial side. So I think it definitely helps to be a large district with IB because we have um, what the IB provides are district workshops so for teachers. Mm -hmm. So we train teachers on site. Um, so it comes out to about you know maybe $400 per teacher as opposed to uh, the regular registration fee for a teacher to be trained in IB is closer to about $800, hmm. not including the travel costs. So if we have to send teachers out, we're talking about maybe that much in travel. So you're talking about $1,500 a teacher as opposed to $400 if you're going to bring them on, um, bring the workshop leaders to you on to uh, your, mm -hmm. into your district. Mm -hmm. So we do save a lot of money. Mm -hmm that way. Now for a smaller district, they do provide workshops for smaller districts. It's just it's definitely more cost effective the larger the larger you are. And how do you go about selecting teachers for the program? I know when Chicago put it, these programs in the original 13 schools, they used existing teachers who were there, right. not specially trained. Is that true of the whole program system wide? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. I mean the teachers with the schools don't hire new teachers to teach IB. You take what you have and you um, develop those teachers and you, te you train them and that's, that's how it works. The principals basically decide who at the school is gonna be <coughs> teaching IB. And one more question. I know that uh, you, all, you didn't talk about the career track, but there are quite a few people in, in our, among our guests who are interested in what a vocational or career track would look like. What's, what's offered? How does it integrate with the academic courses? So I was extremely excited when I first heard about this program, the IB Career Related Program, because what it does is it sort of marriages um, the career track um, option with the rigorous diploma program. So the students have to take a couple diploma program courses and then they have to have, be in a career track at the same time. And I've, I've found it to be a great option for students in, in our district because it's just basically opening up access. We have, we have I think, students in 40 plus different career tracks across the district. So now those students are being given the opportunity to have a, you know, to a feel for IB 
as well. What, can you so. give us some examples of what those tracks are like? So it really runs the gamut. Um, one of our popular um, career tracks is digital media, but we also have broadcast and auto mechanics and culinary programs and allied health programs. So it really is it's a very diverse mm -hmm. array. Mm -hmm. Great, well thank you. So Patrick, um, as you know, one of the strongest arguments against all of these choice models is that they leach money out from the districts. And how do you think about that as a researcher? What do you see and what do you see on the ground? How do you think about that? Sure. Um, basically, uh, in many cases, but not all cases, funding goes down for a district affected by choice. But they also don't have as many students to educate. So on a per pupil basis, spending tends to increase when choice is introduced in a district. Um, Usually, the, like for charter schools, charter schools are funded about 30% below traditional public schools on a per pupil basis. And most voucher, vouchers are worth about 50% of the per pupil costs in traditional public schools. And the tax credit scholarships are worth, worth even less than. So the government is sending some money. It's redirecting some money mm -hmm. from uh, education in traditional public schools to charters or privates. But that's going with the students. And so if the traditional public schools can reduce the scale of what they're providing, it shouldn't affect them in terms of fiscal effects. There has been a, a very good study by Ben Scafidi at um, Georgia State University where he looked at what are fixed costs versus marginal costs when public schools suddenly have to cut costs. Because the, the big argument is that, well, if we lose a couple of students, all of our costs are fixed, so it's bad for the students. Well, what, what, what Ben was able to document is that about two-thirds of the costs in public education are marginal costs that can be modified when student populations change. About one third is fixed. So any school choice arrangement where less than two thirds of the per pupil spending is leaving is actually going to leave the public schools in a better fiscal condition um, than, than they otherwise would have been. Mm -hmm. And just one more question. What's the mechanism by which the kids who are left in the district schools actually do better? And I've seen the Figlio studies mm -hmm. in Florida, but I wasn't sure how the, how the mechanism actually works. Sure, we are definitely right at the forefront of you know, these inside the black box analyses of exactly mm -hmm. how these positive results are coming about. Um, in the Figlio study, you know, it suggests better communication with parents, better advertisement of, mm -hmm. of, of what the school is offering, so better parental awareness uh, might be a part of it. Um, and, that, and that in some cases, the worst performing teachers were, were actually fired, and that it sort of mm -hmm. took this competition to persuade the traditional public school system to jettison their worst performing teachers, and that that was part of the improvement that they saw. But, but that's just one study. There have been very few careful evaluations of the, the, the immediate causes of these outcomes. It's certainly an area for future research. Mm -hmm. And then, Frankie, for you, my, my first question is, what have the policy challenges been for BARD in particular in the early college model? What, how does the funding work mm -hmm. uh, when you're funding both a high school and a college? What are the challenges like? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so we operate like a Baltimore City public school. Um, we, are, we are a contract school, but we're funded like a charter school. Um, so the, I mean, the primary policy challenge, I would say, is, is financial. Um, because it's more expensive to, um, to run a college than a high school in a lot of ways. Um, it's just one example. Um, so uh, every Baltimore City school has um, control over its own budget. You know, it's every, uh, what the phrase is everything from test scores to toilet paper. Um, so because we are an institute of higher education, we need to have people on faculty who have PhDs. It costs about $12,000 per year more in salary to have somebody on faculty with a PhD as opposed to somebody with a bachelor's degree. And so, and you know, in this year, multiply that $12,000 by 11 people. Um, it's just, it's more expensive um, to have the, the folks that we need. Um, so it's, uh, it, wouldn't, it would not be viable for us, I think, to operate the school if we were not being funded um, 
at the per pupil level that charters are given. And this must, must be a rare example where charters are funded um, at, at a higher rate than a traditional school. Um, I think here for in the Baltimore. direct grants, there must have been some direct, some direct state grants in support of. Yeah, depends on how it's calculated that. too. Yeah. I suppose. I Okay, so you're you're make, you're finding your way with the different funding streams that are mm -hmm. available, including Pell grants, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, as we know, any policy intervention is only as good as the implementation, and there is great, I assume, great variability in each of these models. And so I wondered if each of you could say if an early college model doesn't work, if an IB program is foundering and where you see school choice models not generating strong effects. So for example, the Louisiana, what's gone wrong? How can you quantify that? Maybe the early college <laughs> model hasn't gone wrong anywhere. <laughs> well, but if it did, where might it? <laughs> um, if I could, I could give sort of a sideways answer to that question by talking about what I think helps us. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it's that unified whole school model that I mentioned in my presentation. Um, because as I say, there are a lot of dual enrollment programs. Um, I worked in another school here in the city that had a strong dual enrollment program where students would leave our campus after about half the day and then go to another university to, to take their classes. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the principles that makes us successful is one that you find in a lot of schools with a lot of other programs, and that's the power of having a caring adult or a series of caring adults in the building. So for us, you know, you don't have to go off campus to take your college courses because it's with the same faculty member who you saw in the morning because they're your advisor and they know that something was not quite right at home last night and they, that's kind of on their radar. So I'll say, um, for the most part, we have very strong IB programs in Chicago. I mean, they're not all. We, we, there, there are some struggling schools, and what we do for them is we provide support. We provide ad, added, um, you know, specialized uh, professional development for those schools. But I have to say that the, the, the strong programs are because the coordination, there's an IB coordinator at each school, and they are an amazing group of people. I can't say enough about them. They are so strong and hardworking, and the principals at the school are strong, and the teachers at the school are very strong. So for the few, we have a few out of the 22, it's not bad, that might be struggling a little bit, We're, we just continue to provide uh, more support. And I have to say, even at the ones that are struggling, those students are benefiting. They're benefiting from this program, and they're, still, they're, they're going to college at higher rates, mm -hmm. so. And when you say that you give more professional support, is that more in, in terms of subject mastery, that you're helping the teachers be prepared for the subject yeah, itself? It, partly that. Yeah, it depends on what the specific needs are, but yes, right. it's it could be that. So in terms of the Louisiana Scholarship Program, this is a school, the first school voucher program where there's documented evidence that has a negative effect on student achievement, at least in math. And so you have a situation where you look at the program and you look at the state and it's one case and there are sort of seven things that are distinctive about it. Mm -hmm. So oh, which of those seven, you know, is, is driving this, this atypical result? It's really, it's really hard to say. I think one of the most important things when we think about school choice, school choice is not um, a, an educational system itself. It's sort of a, it's, it's, it's an umbrella or governance structure that allows access to different types of schools. And a school choice program is only going to be as good as the quality and the diversity in those offerings that are made available to parents. And in the mm -hmm. case of Louisiana, it, one simple possible explanation is that the quality of the participating private schools is actually mm -hmm. low and, and lower than um, the traditional public schools mm -hmm. that the kids were leaving. That's one possible explanation. The implementation of the program was a nightmare. Um, it was signed into law in the middle of June and there was no lag. It was ordered to go into effect that fall. So um, there are stories of, of private school teachers and administrators who didn't even know. I mean, the, you know, the, some umbrella group committed their schools to participate in the program. They were assigned a whole bunch of students who they'd never seen before, maybe coming from backgrounds that they weren't you know, traditionally used to serving. And they just showed up on day one, and they were completely unprepared for, for this kind of, of change. 
So part of it could have just been the shock and the disruption of this, of this uh, speedy, immediate implementation. When we compare that to Washington, D.C., the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program, it recruited a very strong supply of private schools to participate. Sidwell Friends, Sidwell Friends. Uh, mm -hmm. National Cathedral School, St. John's, Gonzaga. I mean, these, these are all, mm -hmm. um, you know, out, private schools with outstanding reputations serving some of, of the nation's elites. And they are participating. They are accepting some students into their program. Uh, in Louisiana, it tended to be schools that uh, were losing enrollment. Um, they were more likely to participate, and only one third of the entire private school population participated in the Louisiana program, whereas nearly three quarters of the general education private schools in Washington, D.C. participated. You know, if you have, if, if you draw more deeply from the, from the quality pool of private schools, mm -hmm. you'll probably get better effects. Right. So the enabling legislation is important, too, in the kind of accountability structures that are put in place around the receiving schools. Right. And with Louisiana, their accountability system, they had very few constraints at the front end. The schools mm -hmm. have to admit students, um, uh, all the students who apply, who win the vouchers. They, mm -hmm. they cannot apply any admissions criteria. And they have to administer the state test. And they have to be accredited. But most private schools already are accredited. Mm -hmm. um, but the accountability uh, is an, on the back end in terms of it's modeled after No Child Left Behind. So anyone who hated No Child Left Behind, that's the model they used uh, in the Louisiana Voucher Program. And it's basically if aggregate uh, school level scores for your voucher students are low, then you can no longer accept additional students. You're sort of put on probation. Um, and so that's supposed to be the incentive for the private schools to improve operation mm -hmm. or else they're being denied market share. And that's, that's being implemented now, you know, three years into the program. Mm -hmm. Well, I have many more questions, but I know that you all do as well. So why don't we open up to questions from you all. Please just state your name, your affiliation, and ask if you can a very succinct question. Chris Bell, I'm a school teacher, and I'm with Governor's P20 Council. Um, this question is for Sarah. Uh, students in very low uh, socioeconomic settings, multi-family dwellings where there's really no place to do homework, how do they address the poor homework or is homework assigned? Yes, homework's definitely assigned. Uh, that's a really good question. I mean, w this is the majority of the students in our program. So I, I think what happens with with our programs is that students become, it, it's a kind of a tight, sort of becomes a tight family unit. Students really support each other in the program. They um, somehow, I, I, I really, I can't really specifically answer, but somehow they do it. They, they get through, they figure it out. The, the coordinators, I was mentioning that there's a coordinator in the program, they're also like their counselors. Mm -hmm. The students go to them. They, they are very open, and I, I, I could spend hours telling you like the kind of problems that some of these students have, but they make it through. Mm -hmm. some, some of them don't because the problems are so severe, mm -hmm. but th this, is, this is the type of student that's in our program that's managing. Mm -hmm. Schools are open after hours. If we, they, have, they have computer labs, libraries, they can stay. After school, they have access. They, we're fortunate that we have good equipment in our schools, so mm -hmm. we have that opportunity for them. I will say that um, reading the research from the Chicago Consortium of School Research, mm -hmm. one of, the, thing, one of the, the reasons for these strong effects that they speculated about was the peer effect. Yeah. That in contrast mm -hmm. to AP classes, which are one class and one class and one class, that this sense of being part of a community that actually, it, it, they start in ninth grade, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The pre-IB mm -hmm. program is pretty strong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Go ahead, Peter. Hi, uh, Peter Tam from the Baltimore School Board. Um, I guess my question is for the part. Um, you know, tell us how the, the 115 kids that started, how are they transition? How are they transition? Can you tell us to, to the rigorous environment? What have you seen in other campuses where kids have, have been granted up with struggle? Um, and what do you think of that? Right. Um, so we. We drew our students from over 50 um, middle school programs um, 
mostly public but some private parochial and some homeschooling. Um, we gave the students a literature diagnostic and a math diagnostic during our summer bridge program in August so we could kind of see where they were um, because our admissions process um, doesn't look at their grades or their test scores. Um, and so we saw a huge range um, of, of um, skill levels and prior um, preparation, particularly in math. So the math instruction um, that the students were coming with, some of them were coming in at a third grade math level, some of them were coming in and they, were, they had already passed algebra one in the, ninth, in the eighth grade and were ready for geometry. So we took that information and so we used that um, in our curriculum design. Um, so for instance, uh, one of our um, math faculty spent most of the first month of school on basic math review because he knew that that was what the students needed. Um, so we are continuing to look at those, those kinds of data points, um, how students are doing on, at the midterm, how they're doing on report cards and on specific assessments to kind of drive um, assessment, uh, excuse me, interventions that are becoming more individualized as we go along. Um, so for, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have one of our incoming faculty members uh, tonight, Dr. Schroeder, um, who actually, we, we're really fortunate that he's local um, and has been available to come in and do some push-in tutoring um, in our algebra and physics classes for the students that we know at this point in the year are still struggling. Um, so it's, it's a long process and it's a very individualized process, but I think um, you know, that's one of the benefits of, one of the beauties of what we do is really getting to know um, the students and getting to know what they need and then trying to meet those needs as best we can. So I think that's a, a great point, and to be, I'll be totally honest with you, it's not something that I had really so much thought about until the students said, it's coming from the students themselves, very student-driven school, and they said, you know, just because we go to an early college, it doesn't mean that we want to miss out on those kinds of traditional pieces of the high school experience. So in November, a lot of kids started coming into my office and saying, all of our friends are having homecoming but we don't have a football team, so could we have something? So we, so we had a winter formal, right? Because this is an early college, so we didn't have like a dance, but we had a formal. Um, so a lot of those social pieces, the extracurricular life of the school, um, the fact that the year one students were clamoring for a prom, um, they really want a school ring and they want to design it, is really, that's a cue that we take from the students. Um, and also that we heard from families as well. So we got that question a lot from parents. Um, is there gonna be a prom? Um, because that's important to us, and I understand as a parent as well that you don't want to feel like your student is missing out on those things because they go to an early college. That's a good question. They have not closed any of any schools that have IB. As a matter of fact, when, when they closed the schools, um, this was, I think, I want to say two or three years ago, the, the, uh, if you ha didn't know, there were about 50 elementary schools in Chicago that were closed. And they, uh, what they did was they, they ha had existing schools as what was called welcoming schools. So the students that were at those closed schools would come into that welcoming school. And um, six of the welcoming schools, I can't remember exactly how many there are, but six of those actually are applying for IB authorization right now. So they, um, a decision, you know, a strategic decision was made to offer something more at those schools that were becoming these welcoming schools. And so those are IB. 
And when Chicago did close those schools, the welcoming schools all had to be higher performing schools than the mm -hmm. schools that had been closed. Mm -hmm. So they really, I remember reading, again, Chicago Consortium for School Research, that they had planned it out, they had arranged for the transportation, and they ensured that kids went to a higher performing, mm -hmm. performing school. Do you have a question? Sure. So, so charter schooling is showing its clearest positive effects for disadvantaged students in urban environments. It's clearly a very good match for Baltimore, and it's not likely to catch fire in Montgomery County because Montgomery County already has a set of uh, of well-regarded public schools. And and so, you know, that that's the whole idea of school choice. It's almost like it's almost like a release valve. Um, and and if things are going well, we all know this as parents, if things are going well for our kids in whatever schools they're in, we leave them there. You know, we're risk averse. We don't, if it, is, if it ain't broke, we don't fix it. In many urban environments, public schooling is broken and, and you know, parents really need alternatives and that's why most public charter schools locate in urban environments in poor neighborhoods because they know that's where alternatives to public schooling are most in demand. Eric. Yeah, hi, Eric Rice, uh, out here at the School of Education. Um, my question is for Sarah, and I was really interested in your comparison of uh, student user versus the rest of the district. <laughs> uh, and it looks like one thing that jumped out at me, I think, is that you serve a much lower number of black students than the traditional schools. So I guess it's a two-part question. First is, did I read that right? It's, it's, you, you are right, actually, and what, um, recently we were looking at that, actually, and analyzing how, why is that happening, and unfortunately, the schools um, in the traditionally African-American neighborhoods have um, decreased enrollment considerably, and um, I don't want to blame the charter schools, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> I think that's a very big factor because of exactly mm -hmm. exactly what Patrick was just saying. The charter schools tend to open in neighborhoods where there's very disadvantaged students. So in those neighborhoods, there's been a sort of influx of charter schools. And so our, our traditional African-American neighborhood, neighborhood schools that at one time, maybe 15 years ago, had 2,000 students in them, now have 150. So we can't really place IB. In, in a school that small, it's not it's not really cost effective. It's not it's not even that doable for us. Um, we we need you know we want to reach as many students as we can. So what's interesting is that in the neighborhoods. I don't know if you notice on the slide that there's also a disproportionate amount of Hispanics. There's more Hispanic students in IB than in the district, and that's because in those neighborhoods we're busting at the seams. Those neighborhood schools are two, 3,000 students in them. So I, I, I believe that's the, that's the explanation. Um, it's a district-wide issue that we need to address. Um. So how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes. It's, it's pretty complex. Um, so how do I sum this up? So as I said earlier, these are neighborhood schools. So these are open enrollment schools that IB is in. So any student in that neighborhood can go to that school, can end up in, in the diploma program once they're in 11th grade. You, there's not full choice if I'm in a different neighborhood. You can. 
you can. That, that's another option. So if you're in another neighborhood, you can travel, and we have students that do this, travel an hour you know, on the bus, on the train, to get to an IB school. That's possible as well. There is an application process for that. Let's take one more question. Go ahead. Right, so we, we have a really vibrant extracurricular life um, that was student driven. So we went to the students and asked them what it was that they wanted to do. And then we matched the clubs that they were looking for the most with a faculty moderator. Um, so this year we were able to start with 17 clubs um, and boys and girls, JV and varsity basketball. Um, so then the clubs are, you know, anything that you might expect to see at a high school, like a newspaper and a literary magazine, but we also have uh, anime, electronics, cooking, clubs, we have an LGBTQ organization, um, all suggested by the students. Um, for our admissions process, we're a part of the City Schools High School Choice application. Um, so we had a series of open houses um, starting in September where students could come get information about the school, do the first part of our admissions process, which is a writing assessment. And then we ask them to come back to do an interview. Um, so we have another open house coming up on February 11th, if you know a student who's interested. All right, Freddie, really quickly. Well, I just want to make a comment. Even though Montgomery County is a great school district and is one that has a former superintendent who works for the county, if they decide to pay, I think this is one of the things that comes out when we look at international data as well, that when you even, even comparing our so-called wonderful suburban schools, we're still underperforming vis-a-vis -vis students in the same demographic group. So I think we, we need to close. I know we could go on for another hour. I certainly could. <laughs> um, I think in closing, I'll just comment that one of the things that certainly the IB program and the Bard Early College High School model have, and that some, but clearly not all, of the programs that you study have in common is that they provide academic challenge for our students and, and that our students rise to meet it. And so I'm reminded of something that our director, David Steiner, says quite frequently, which is that as a country, we under-challenge our students. And it's certainly encouraging to me to see the results of what happens when we display this and offer it to students who can clearly thrive. So thank you all very much for coming.